Thank you, Ken, for your wonderful presentation and also the beautiful reading. And now it's our panel talk, and let's welcome back the other speakers. Hello, everyone. Is you here? And Rafik may uh, sort of like have no time to join us for the panel, so because he's missing, and uh, we start uh, the panel talk. And uh, Philip, Professor Philip is going to be the host of this panel. And uh, at the same time, I will collect questions from the audiences. And the audiences in the webinar can type your questions in QA box. Okay, let's begin. Philip? Yeah, I will start with a question to Ken. It's a, it's a pity that um, Rafiki cannot join us. Um, the question about the talk that Ken delivered to us just now is, I mean, I, I, I think that the talk was extremely interesting, but I think he missed one point. So, Basically, if I understand correctly, said that uh, humans um, learn through very concrete experiences, and I agree about this. And the reason why humans learn this way is because we are embodied. Um, our body affects heavily the way how we think the way how we feel um if we um if we think in a different way we will go back to the cartesian dualism distinguishing between mind and body mind on one side the body on the other side and uh, we become something like as gilbert Ray was saying, kind of ghosts in the machine. So humans are embodied. And this makes a fundamental difference between uh, any attempt to recreate an artificial intelligence in the sense of strong AI and uh, us as humans. But I think that it, it, this is the, the, the first question that I wanted to raise. I think that... Um, um, Machines could have their own way to write novels, exactly as machines have their own way to create uh, visual art. And this is my first question. The second question is related to the ethical um, challenges coming from AI today. Um, you mentioned um, the way how in some the way how AI uh, manipulates our own lives, our own stories. Actually, AI, you said, is able to write our own stories. So the second question is all about the challenges that uh, AI is, is, is addressing to us, to our societies, from a, a political, from a social point of view. I would like to to hear your opinion about this. Thanks. Uh, yeah, this is amazing. Um, I don't know who wants to go first because I have lots to say. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll let other people. Okay, you, can go, you can go. You can go. Uh, I, I really, I mean, I love these questions because these are the very things that I think about all the time. I mean, as to your first question, I have no doubt uh, computers will write novels and I have no doubt they already are writing wonderful poetry. The problem is, are these going to be novels and poems that are going to be interesting to us or, or not? I, that, I think the jury is still out. Um, I have focused a lot of my energy recently on the idea of, of AI-assisted creativity, not so much as you know, independent AI creation. I think those are two different topics, actually. While I do find independent AI creation is interesting, I'm much more interested in the, in the AI-assisted creativity side of things. Um, and it's always been very strange to me that despite a huge amount of advancement in every other art form, um, 
AI that's meant to help novelists just have not really taken off. Uh, and I've worked with a lot of companies and a lot of people on this, um, and they have perfectly good intentions and ideas. Um, and I've rarely found what they do helpful. Um, there have been lots of ideas about how maybe we can uh, generate something for novelists similar to the way um, filters work for visual artists. Maybe you can give it an idea and have the AI write your idea in different styles. Uh, maybe you can have AI transform the, the prose into some different register. Maybe you can have it do all this and that. Maybe you can have a continual conversation. Um, a lot of these things can be done with GPT-3, um, and I've, I've tried that. But honestly, I just find them not terribly interesting. Uh, they don't work for me. Not in the same way, for example, my wife gets inspired of when she's playing with um, AI filters uh, with her photography. Um, so I think there is some sort of fundamental thing we're still missing that we're not quite cracking yet. Um, I, I have seen some experiments that are much more interesting. So for example, you know, one of the things that ended up in my story is this whole vector space of all usages of all human languages. That is a thing that AI has been able to do. And that is a thing that has ended up being really interesting. Um, using this sort of vector space of multidimensional uh, vector space of, of semantic usages, we can do things like map out a route from, say, uh, avocado to uh, keyboard and see what words in the semantic space forms the shortest path between those two words. And that is incredibly interesting because what you end up realizing is that AI is able to discover metaphors and routes in the way we understand space that we had not thought of. It's very similar to how AI Go players can discover strategies that human Go players can't seem to discover. Uh, but once presented to them, they're like, oh, this is this is wonderful. Um, that kind of thing can be very inspiring to novelists. I, I think I was very inspired when I found these. And I, I was like, wow, that's a metaphor I never thought of. This is this is incredible. So I think that route is promising. Um, I, I don't really know how that's going to go in the future. Um, but that's one area I, I, I remain really, really optimistic about. The other part of your question, um, as far as um, the challenges. Uh, oh, boy, uh, I, I think it's such a, I really wish I could live longer so I can see how it plays out. I mean, the, the idea that AI will be able to now help us tell our stories um, and challenge a lot of our assumptions. I mean, you know, humans have been telling stories to each other and fighting over these stories for millennia. Um, what if we have AI who can tell completely post-human, fundamentally inhuman stories? What will that do to us? What will that do to our ideas about politics, about social organization, about everything? Um, so rather than thinking about how we can get machines to be ethical in the way we want them to be ethical, I am both terrified but also excited to imagine machines presenting us with models of ethics that are fundamentally not human-centric and not based on humans, and how we will be able to face that challenge and either integrate with it or, or you know, fundamentally transform ourselves. Um, I, that makes me so excited. I don't know how that's going to play out. Okay, thanks. I, I, think, yeah. I think one of the things that's sort of interesting about these ideas is that there's a notion that, you know, there's a classical idea of the author that they're sort of like monadic. There's an individual author and there's an individual work or there's an individual author in a series of works. But I think what's kind of interesting about this notion that um, uh, that disinformation actually is part of this longer story of interactions, not with one person, but with a whole society, with a collection of people, is that there's this notion of, I don't know if it's collective authorship, but this sort of like networked understanding of the production of some kind of work, which is not an, not an individual author, but a whole series of sentient beings interacting in various ways some of them being human and some of them being uh some of them being artificial and i think that's also one of the things that that i found intriguing about or that we were curious about in our uh in our piece is that there's this this notion that artificially intelligent agents can begin to coordinate or negotiate or communicate with not only ourselves, but also non-human agents and can begin to be these sort of like uh, mediators or referees or, you know, one of many different agents in a collection of, uh, in a collection of agents. 
I think there's this funny question also about authorship there, which, you know, I, Philippa, I'm curious, uh, you know, I've been in my thinking about authorship recently, I've started to think that the author, you know, fundamentally on a legal level is first someone that claims authorship. And so no matter to what degree you're using sort of like AI tools or other kinds of processes, until the AI can start to make a legal argument for why they should be considered an author, um, you are you are the author, and it's sort of like unambiguous from a legal point of view. So, I think there's this really interesting dimension of um, of thinking about creation, which is you know kind of like legal framework, which also begins to um, uh, impinge on notions of personhood, uh, which is obviously also related to uh, related to sentience. Uh, and all of the rights that attend that. So, anyway, this sort of like network mode of authorship, I find I find really interesting and a new possibility mm -hmm. actually uh, for uh, that that AI brings in a more amplified way than in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, Andrew, I have a question because I mean, you mentioned many times uh, you use this expression many times, and I would like to understand better what you mean with this expression. You said that. Um, you use the expression ethically conscious AI. What do you mean with this expression, especially as concerns the label, the word conscious, ethically conscious AI? Could you clarify this point? Yeah, I mean, conscious, conscious is obviously sort of like a loaded term, and maybe we bracket that, but I think there is this way in which, you know, it, in our piece, the idea is that this AI is not only coordinating data, it's not only this sort of like, I don't know, machine for triage around information or this, um, this armature for collaboration. It's something that begins to realize consequence and something that might begin to realize implication. Um, I don't know if it's causality necessarily, but it begins to think about, or not think, but it begins to sort of like conjecture on what may have led to this situation and it begin, you know maybe begins to sort of like relate to agents in a particular way so i think there I, it seems like there could be a moment when an ai begins to understand you are liable for this action you you know you you some other entity were responsible for this action uh, you caused this um, you know, similar to our sort of like notion of culpability, but it, you know, maybe purely in, there's a sort of like, um, uh, I don't know, intuition around causality or sort of a uh, notion of causality or ascription of causality. And then when that happens, I think we run into some very complicated questions. Um, I had a, I had a question in the chat actually about um, what happens if, the AI begins to see the causality of its own energy use in this process of sort of uh, trying to remediate, remediate the planet, you run into these very weird, like existential dilemmas, um, which, you know, we encounter all the time, but the way that an AI might respond to those existential dilemmas, uh, I think is a really, I think is a really interesting question. And that's, you know, maybe that's, it's probably, a bridge further than a Turing test. It's this this moment at which the AI situates itself itself in a causal chain. Um, that's something that I think will uh, have some strange uh, strange implications. And so the, the ethical dimension of that is just I don't mean ethical in the sense of sort of like value judgment exactly, but I mean that there's some. Uh, understanding of action or some sort of like analysis of action in such a way that certain actions are um, are deemed appropriate or inappropriate or uh, right or wrong could be a little bit strong, but there's some way of making, of comparing actions. That's, that's the, the crux of what ethics is. It's comparing actions and making a choice based on um, qualities of those actions. Andrew, I, I want to follow up on what you said there because it's uh, it's really interesting to me. Um, 
your notion of collective authorship and this whole idea of ethically conscious AI made me think of, of the following, which is one tendency of, of AI or the proliferation of what we call AI um, is uh, a lot of challenges to the idea of responsibility um, and an agency. It's very similar to what bureaucracy does, right? Bureaucracy as a technology has, as one of its features, this diffusion of agency and responsibility. Uh, a bureaucracy can never commit any crimes because there's no individual agent who's responsible for anything. Um, so, for example, you know, a police force may uh, decide not to go in and save some kids for an hour. And ultimately, you can say there's no one responsible because it's just a collective decision that the bureaucracy made. AI has a similar kind of feature, which is that, um, you know, for example, a machine learning algorithm ends up causing a traffic accident, killing someone who actually is responsible. You know, it's not the programmer. The programmer has no idea how the AI ended up doing this. It's not exactly the, the silicon. It's not the data. It's not it's not anything. It's sort of like. When, you know, Microsoft puts out one of its AI agents, chatbots, and somebody gets it to say racist things, who is responsible? Clearly, the programmer never intended this. Uh, the person provoking it, is it really responsible or is, is the Internet responsible? We AI always ends up getting us into this place where we just don't know where the responsibility is. And I think that's deeply um, troubling and, and scary. Um, and related to that, one more thing I want to say is that um, I think machine learning and the proliferation, proliferation of AI has also had a tendency to reduce humans to the level of machines. There is a tendency in modern life to regulate people and make people as machine-like as possible. Um, you know, those who work in customer servers are supposed to follow scripts. They're supposed to basically read things as though they are machines. Uh, we, we, we tell people in warehouses to do exactly what the machine says, go to this shelf, pick this up. There's a, there's a, there's a sense in which we're taking responsibility away from individuals by subsuming it to machine knows best. Uh, you know, delivery workers, uh, drivers are supposed to follow the routes that the machine gives them. Um, it's also interesting to me, again, you know, when something goes wrong, whose responsibility is it? Um, we don't seem to have a good answer for this. Right now, we're sort of stumbling along, but we, we really, we are not, in my view, ethically conscious about how we're treating AI and how we're using AI. Honestly, honestly mm -hmm. speaking, I think that uh, this is not only a problem of AI, it's a general problem concerning innovation in the sense that uh, innovation uh, tends to focus just on the technological box rather than looking at the impact and the side effects related to the introduction of that, te that technology inside our societies. This is the main point. But I have a last question. I don't know if I have still time. Um, um, uh, Sisi, still I have some time or not? Uh, yes, go on, please. And later, probably, we'll leave five minutes for the audience questions. And okay. uh, I recognize that actually most of the questions related to the authorship of AI creation and also sort of like who is the author. So okay. I think you can go on and uh, also I can uh, select the questions for you guys later. I have another footnote about authorship later, but... Yeah, sure. <laughs> go, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I, I just think it's actually very related to this question of responsibility. I think an alternate formulation for authorship is like, who do you blame if something is terrible? Do you know what I mean? Exactly. Who's culpable if something, if this artwork is sort of like garbage? Who do you, who do you blame? And yeah. I, you know, it's, it's, oh, a little well, bit well, but I think that's a part of what authorship is. It's like, who, who do you assign that culpability to? Okay. You, you have a very good example in the sense that in March 2018, for the first time, a self-driving car killed a lady, and um, the authorities spent like one year in order to investigate the accident, and at the end, the conclusion was amazing, at least from my point of view, and the conclusion was that the, back the backup driver was the guilty one. It was the only one which was blamed because of the accident, not the self-driving car itself, not the company which was behind the self-driving car itself. And this mm -hmm. is quite amazing if you think about self-driving car, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I have, but I have uh, one question more uh, because, um, because we have been speaking about the Turing test. Um, do you think that the Turing test is still... Uh, 
a valid test for assessing the intelligence of an artifact, of an artificial intelligence? This is my question. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, the thing that I think is interesting about the Turing test is that for, you know, essentially since its inception, it's been, I think it's been understood as the, as the gold standard of sort of like evaluating some, it's not even like artificial intelligence, but some artificial, um, mm-hmm. like uh, something that is capable of artificial action or sort of like computer generated action or something. And intelligence has been understood as sort of like, the sort of sin qua non of, of humanity. And I think what's interesting is that as artificial intelligence advances, we're beginning to think about other things which, <clears throat> which have a human dimension and which are critical to humanity. So like values or, you know, this, this idea of responsibility. There are these other aspects of who we are as humans that, um, that extend beyond intelligence. So the Turing test, I feel like there's a kind of like, library of different kinds of tests which are analogous to the Turing test but sort of confront some artificial entity with other kinds of questions they could be questions around perception they could be questions around you know ethical judgment they could be all these other sorts of questions you know the Turing test is it's a very textual kind of thing but we are not only textual beings um, and so I don't know I think the Turing test is sort of like the beginning of maybe a whole series of tests that actually test different dimensions of, um, of our relationship to, to these artificial entities. Yeah. And also I think the Turing test has largely been misunderstood and, and misused. I mean, you know, if you read Turing's original paper, he makes it clear that this is not a test about intelligence at all. <laughs> he, he makes it clear that this is a game. It's about imitation. And in some ways it is about, how well can computers lie and pretend, um, which is not the same thing as intelligence at all. He was asking a very narrow question. Can can machines do this one thing? And I think we have ended up sort of misusing it and misapplying it. Um, in fact, for the issues that we care about, which is can AI challenge us and give us something truly new, a new model of intelligence, a new way of approaching the world, thinking about the world, telling stories, understanding art, whatever. Um, the, the goal of that ought to be not, ought not to be imitating humans, but, but something entirely different. Uh, and we just, we've gotten to the point where, you know, it's the same story in AI. Whenever you reach some goalposts, it, it turns out to be not the thing you're interested in at all. We've gotten close to passing the Turing test, and now we realize this is actually not interesting at all. <laughs> the thing we're interested in is much more uh, beyond that. Uh, and I think that's healthy. Um, we, we, we look for the next thing that's, that's interesting to us. Yeah, I think that there is as well a tendency on the side of human beings to defend their own uh, anthropocentric role in this world. So each yep, time absolutely. AI achieves something, I'm thinking about uh, IBM Deep Blue or uh, AlphaGo or recently, more recently, GPT-3. I mean, each time AI achieves something, we move ahead in the sense that we say, oh, it's not enough. And then we introduce other elements uh, related to intelligence, like, for instance, ethics. You mentioned ethics as an element missing for defining someone or something like an intelligent uh, agent. And this is, uh, I think, a a human tendency uh, in order to keep its own role in, on this, in, in this universe, in this world. Anyway, um, she, do you want to move to the questions from, uh, from the audience? Uh, yeah, sure. Actually, uh, I think um, sort of like half hours ago, most of the questions about the, uh, the the roles of artists or creators. Now we got several other questions, which is quite interesting. Probably I combine them together to ask you all. And the one is that what are the potential AI a- applications in the built environment? And another question similar to the, related. Sorry, I understand that in the. I, what are the potential AI applications in the built environment, in the physical environment? Uh, if I yeah didn't misunderstand. And another question, which is which is quite related, is that because of AI and virtual 
environments? How can we build up the connections or what's our identity as human being? I think probably when they, when we connect these two questions together, you can answer it about it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'll, I'll tackle the question about AI applications and built environment. So, uh, the project that I showed today was a very particular kind of project that looks at, looked at the question of the relationship between AI and ecology. But one of the things that I think was common with some potential applications in the built environment was this uh, possibility of s- scaling up the process or the possibility of sense making in AI ac- to a vast scale. And uh, what's interesting about that is that we can use processes of sort of like pattern recognition, object recognition, classification, and so forth, to really sort of like organize our world in a way uh, where that we couldn't really in the past. And so one of the projects that I showed the sort of like last year's version of the conference that we're continuing to think about is the process of thinking about waste or, you know, construction demolition or other kinds of like byproducts actually of the construction process, byproducts of the built environment we can use AI to classify those and then facilitate the process of stitching those together into new kinds of, uh, into new kinds of structures. And so that's something that, you know, it, it's a little bit like trying to solve a puzzle that's too difficult for humans to solve alone, um, where, you know, we can use AI actually to augment our, um, uh, our capacities for problem solving in terms of reassembling uh, this uh, or assembling new kinds of objects from that waste. And I, I don't know, I, th- I feel like that's a really interesting potential. Um, and then, of course, there's a related potential, which is just sort of like classifying the world that we live in, classifying every building that ever existed and thinking about those uh, as this sort of like um, family tree of, of architecture. There's a way in which we don't really know what architecture is, but we can we now can look at every building that that's has that has existed and map out those family trees and i think that's a that's a powerful uh possibility for understanding what that art form is how how do we look at that holistically um i will also follow up on talking about um ai and built spaces um and my interest here again is uh, on the interaction between humans and machines uh and i think there's a lot of really interesting phenomenon that's already sort of showing up um very recently i was visiting a college campus uh somewhere in the midwest and uh what amazed me was that during the pandemic the students were entirely locked down in their dorms and they couldn't go out and so the school actually innovated and bought these um, little uh, autonomous carts that could deliver food to the different dorms. The students would just order their food and the food would be placed inside one of these robots and they'll just go around campus, deliver to the right student. Uh, And these little carts were still in use and they were running around the campus, very cute. Um, What I found interesting was that these carts would occasionally get stuck um, or have problems routing around something. And the students were inevitably very happy to go and help them out. Uh, students passing by these little robots are happy to stop by and just help them out. Like they would help out a lost pet or something. Um, and this is, you know, very hopeful. I, I, I love seeing the fact that, um, you know, we, we, we feel like uh, this is something that's very natural to do, that we feel that here's an agent in the physical universe trying to accomplish something um, and it's it's stuck and and we want to go help it uh, and I totally relate with uh, with what the students are doing because you know a lot of us have uh, robot vacuum cleaners and they often get stuck if you have one and uh, it's it's always kind of a nice moment to see your kids going over to help them out uh, trying to free them and help them do their thing um, so I'm very hopeful about the future of, of um, AI in built space I, I think there's a lot of interesting potential stories yet to be told and to be seen and to be written about how humans and machines share space and how we can, in fact, help each other be better agents. We are embodied agents and we know how to navigate this space more naturally uh, than these machines and we can help them out. Uh, and I think there's something really beautiful about that. Okay, very th- thank you very much. And also, I think probably there is going to be a last question. And there is a 
one question saying that because of now uh, the visual models like DALI is very popular and also GPT-3 is very popular for writers. So how do you, um, and let's say it's two for two creators, how do you think about the roles? As it, when the models appear to us and what's the interaction between reading and saying and what's how to redefine reading and saying? Andrew wanted to say something about Dali or Yeah, I mean one of the things that I think is so that's so interesting about Dali is that it begins to bridge this space between literature, literature and criticism and visual art production. You know, there those two things have been a sent from a disciplinary point of view have been distinct. I mean, you create art, you create sort of like visual art and you're sort of like in the medium of that art, um, or you're reflecting on it, you're sort of narrating a response, you're formulating criticism, you're essentially in the business of constructing language to respond to that art. And one of the things, you know, maybe alluding to some of the stuff that Ken was mentioning earlier, you know, now that we have this vector space of language and we have another vector space of, uh, of image, those two things can be can be merged. They can be, be embedded. And this is one of the things that I think is really interesting about something like Dali or Clip or some of these other sort of like multimodal models is that suddenly you have this capacity to bring many different types of representation, many different types of sensation, many different types of experience, and actually make them somehow mutually interchangeable. And, you know, synesthesia has been sort of like interesting to artists since I don't know, yeah. since the early modern period. But this is something actually much bigger than that. It's like thinking about every kind of artistic representation is somehow being mutually interoperable. And it's like this, you know, the total work of art, it's almost like you have this, this way in which works of art can somehow um, be in dialogue with each other. You know, this the poem can be a kind of image or the image can be a kind of novel or the novel can be a kind of musical score. It's like all of those things actually have like live in the same embedded latent space. And I think that's something that's really, that's something that I feels new to me, that sense of sort of like limitless interoperability between art forms. That's, that's something, I think it's something super intriguing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would follow up on that by saying that we sort of live in this moment where there's a huge amount of potential and possibility and almost all the leading AI uh, labs are pursuing uh, models very similar to what we're talking about here, which is to finally break through this idea that um, AI is not really able to help storytelling much. And we're really trying to break through that and, and trying to get to the next stage. My main concern here is... Um, I think we'll make real progress only if we take these efforts actually seriously, by which I mean this. It's very easy to sort of make some prototype and say, look, you know, look at the possibilities and potential here. But it's much harder to actually go and execute something that people will take seriously and say, this is interesting. This is actually a piece of art that I, I actually find to be deeply engaging and interesting. I would I would devote my time to thinking and consuming this deeply. Um, so far, we are way too obsessed with toy-like applications of these ideas. I have not seen enough effort to really engage with these ideas in a serious way and to push them beyond just the toy stage. I think that's the big challenge. Um, can we get people to actually engage with this in a serious way and see if there's anything there there? Um, anything when you're just first exploring it and sort of throwing out things is very easy and trivial, but trying to create something that actually feels like a piece of art that you're proud of, that feels like something you will stand behind as a creator and say, I want to be blamed for this if it doesn't get appreciated and I want to get all the credit when people love this that's hard that's very very hard um and so far i i just have not seen anything that really uh takes this seriously and pushes into that direction um and and i want us to try to get there um so that's that's what i would say there are many Great. papers which actually show that uh, humans are not able to distinguish uh, um a piece of art generated by machine from a piece of art generated by a human. And this makes an important distinction from my point of view. I mean, us humans are not able to distinguish between the two. 
and 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 it's a fact. It's a fact. Uh, it's a fact uh, uh, that has been proved by a number of papers. You can find these papers in the literature. It means something from my point of view. Okay, great. Thank you. I think that's all the contents of our session one. And thank you, the speakers, and also all of our audiences. And the next next session will be in four hours, and from four p.m. to seven p.m. And also, I would like to uh, remind you that um, if you wanted to know more about the authorship of the creator or the what is the role of the artists or creators? Last year we got the conference. The same is that what is the author? So you probably you can check last conference to see uh, if you can find the answers. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.